Nelson, founder of VoiceLessons.com, and with me I have Dr. Matthew Edwards. Matt, welcome to the show again. Hey, glad to be here. Awesome. Well, we have a wonderful show prepared for you. And if you're out there and you have a question about singing, whether you're a teacher or a, or a singer, student, drop your question in the chat because this is live. We're live right now. We're going to make some mistakes, but just bear with us. We're going to have a good, fun time answering your questions. So jump on in with us. All right, first question up for today. This one comes in from Darren. Darren writes in, how can singers achieve a more stable larynx position, especially when ascending, right? Because you know when you're ascending, it's like, uh, right? So how do you, Darren, great question. And Matt, what, what do you think on this one? So it, there's multiple ways that you can do this, Darren. So your larynx is rising for one of two reasons either because the muscles underneath of your chin are tightening and when those tight they're dragging your larynx up there's also some other muscles as well but we're going to focus tonight on these two either under here is dragging it up or you are holding your vocal folds so tightly together that all of the air in your lungs is just pushing and shoving up against those vocal folds and pushing that larynx higher Either one of those two things can be problematic. So let's talk about the vocal fold issue first, because this is real common. Uh, people are going for a powerful high note, so they get those vocal folds firmly together, and they just hold on and keep them firm even as they're going up, and then as they get higher in pitch, the vocal folds are stretching, so they're getting tighter, and uh, they're vibrating more times a second, and that kind of creates this perfect disaster, where you then hit a, a spot where you just either start going flat, the voice cuts out, or you crack. So what you really need to do in that moment is start letting more air out before you hit the problematic note. So let's say the note is a G. So you want to make sure that about a fifth below the G, so like that middle C, you want to start having a little bit more breathiness come into the voice. Now, not a lot, it's, it's subtle, right? So the difference between pressing and full, so this is me pressing, ah, and this is me letting a little bit of air through, ah, I still have the same basic vibratory tone, right? I'm just making vocal fold sounds right now. We're not trying to make a pretty sound or a good sound. But you can hear that vocal fold sound of, ah, sounds real grindy. And, ah, is way, it got more flow in it. Now, if it was really flowy, it would be breathy. Ah, and we don't want that. But it's actually by doing breathy exercises that you're going to teach your body how to let a little bit more air come out. Now, traditionally, these have been called head register exercises. And so in, when we're in head register, we're in that lighter, breathy place. And it's often found, the reason they call it head register, it's often found in the upper part of the range. But in commercial styles, we can make that sound throughout the range. So we want to start usually a little higher to get our body into that uh, really light place that comes with falsetto. Um, we want to get a light and bright ooh or an o or an ah. And try to get your body to sing breathy. Now, uh, a lot of singers who come to me who are in your situation, they're so used to singing tight, they can't do that. They'll try to give me ah, and it really squeezes on them. So if you're struggling with that, I want you to look up at the sky like this, stick your tongue out, and then try it. Ah. Most of the time, Looking up will release your throat muscles and you get your tongue out of the way and the breathiness will start to come through. Then what you're going to do is carry that breathiness as low as it will possibly go. And you're going to want to do that many, 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 many times. Then you're going to want to start getting used to going from a regular sound to a breathier sound and back. So you're going to start this pretty low in your range. Ah. Because we want your body to start thinking about lightening up as it goes up in pitch instead of staying consistent, right? Because like I said, when we get to those high notes, we got to let more air out. It means we got to lighten up. So even if you're in the most bottom part of your range, uh, I'm just trying to put that program in so that when we get higher, uh, we can thin out. 
forget about those notes. Ah, just coasting through. Then you start adding a little bit more voice until you find the sound that you want. Right? I'm a baritone in one of our many Virginia uh, uh, seasonal allergy moments, so that's just where my voice is and what it sounds like right now. But if you're, uh, you know, another voice type and it's a brighter voice, a younger voice, you're going to do the same functional thing. By functional, I mean you got to get your voice to do the same action, but you're going to get a different output. So you're not trying to match my output; you're trying to match my function, and I think that that's really, really important: is function, not output. And so as you match that function, it should start to release some of the breath pressure that's built up underneath those folds and your larynx won't raise as much. Now, the other thing that happens is we get tongue tension involved and those muscles underneath will grab. Now, sometimes that tongue tension comes because you're sticking your neck out like that for a high note. That's not going to help. You want to make sure that your head is balanced off of the AO joint. It's the, uh, the little ball socket in between your ears that connects your skull to your cervical vertebrae, the vertebrae in your uh, neck. So you want to make sure your head is balanced and then you also want to make sure your jaw isn't grabbing because if your jaw is grabbing it will lock up these muscles and it will tighten things up if you've checked those things and your tongue is not tightening or your uh, tongue muscles under here are still tightening then you need to start working on some tongue agility exercises and working on trying to overcome some tongue tension and uh, we don't have enough time to go into all of that tonight but if you go back into our archives you can find out a little bit uh, more about that if you want to read a little bit about it you can jump over to my blog edwardsvoice.blog and if you really want to dive into it i have an online course called how the voice works and uh, we can pop the link up here in a minute on the screen but in how the voice works i actually go through and show you all the tongue muscles i show you some mri images and tune your ears up a little bit so you know what you're even listening for and then i walk you through a whole series of exercises to help you uh break up that tongue tension because honestly it's not something i just cover in five minutes you kind of need to understand a few other things so that's why the, the course can be helpful but again you know jump back into our archives you'll probably hear me mentioning it and if you jump over to my blog you'll get a little taste of what we're talking about as well awesome well Thanks for summarizing that. And yeah, definitely check out the course if you guys have an interest. But you know what? We have our first question, Matt. So I'm going to jump over to the chat. This question just came in live. So Tiffany, hey, thanks for tuning in. With us. Right. Tiffany writes in, what is your opinion regarding engaging the abdominal wall while singing? Some teachers use this idea while others say to stay completely relaxed in this area. What are your thoughts? Well, first, hi, Tiffany. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, great to see you joining us. Um, what my thoughts on this is, is it depends on what you're trying to do. And I think that's where traditional training gets a lot of things wrong is in traditional training, we think there's a one size fits all approach for lots of things. But when you're working in commercial styles and musical theater styles, there is no one size fits all approach. You could have one artist that sings the song nasally. You can have one that sings the same song really breathy. You can have somebody else that comes in and just lets it wail and belt. You can have somebody that like puts, you know, even a pop rock song with a little uh, harp and then they sing operatically over it, right? You can take any song and cover it in any version that you want. So when we're working with, uh, you know, commercial artists, CCM artists, you got to think about what they're trying to do at the vocal fold level and what kind of uh, support that needs. And by support, I mean, like, you know, if you're building a house, you put supports underneath of it to hold it up. So your respiratory system is there to kind of lift up your vocal folds and give them whatever they need to balance out in the way that they need to balance out. So let's say that you're singing really breathy intentionally. And if you're really young, you might be able to just take a breath and you might be able to just not even think about anything and it'll just work for you. If you go to the gym a lot and you have a six pack of abs, if you breathe in, you may find that your abs automatically contract in. And if they do that, it could actually make your throat feel tight. And if you were a trained opera singer, you could pull your abs in as you sing and you may blow out too much air where it sounds like you're working for it. You would hear, me. we could get something like that. Or we could really struggle to get a breathy tone because the vocal folds are stuck together. So in this instance, you have to pick what the goal is and then pick the thing that goes with it. If it's a de-energized moment, a low emotional state ability, uh, of being like sadness or calmness, uh, in those situations, we're usually in intimate space, something like two foot away. We don't need to take a huge breath and use abdominal contraction when somebody's two foot away. Instead, what we need to do is we need to just let the air escape. Now, let's say we're at the end of defying gravity. 
Now, if I have a singer who's, let's say, 45 years old, they've been singing for quite a while, and they have super strong folds. Could be when that singer goes up to hit those high notes in defying gravity, they really need to clench their abdominal wall. Because as we age, the vocal folds do thicken up a bit. And there's hormonal changes that happen uh, in all singers' voices. And our lung capacity starts decreasing in our mid-30s, so the person in their 40s is already has a decreasing lung capacity. However, the singer at age 21 has peak lung capacity. And at that age, let's say that singer just came through a musical theater training program where they were dancing all day and they have super strong abdominal uh, muscles. They may find that if they contract their abs when belting, it's way too much air pressure. Everything goes sharp or their voice cracks. So for them, it's actually more important to relax the abdominal wall and resist the collapse and let the lungs do the work themselves because the lungs are more elastic in the 20s than they are in the 40s. In the 40s, they need a little bit of help. In the 20s, a lot of times they don't. It can also depend on what vowel you're trying to sustain. If you're trying to sustain an E vowel, well, an E vowel uh, doesn't have much space between the tongue and the roof of the mouth, which means that you're not getting a bunch of air flowing through the vocal tract or a bunch of sound. An E appears loud because it has high harmonics and our ears actually amplify the upper frequencies uh, of any sound and uh, makes them appear louder to us than the exact same sound uh, lower. Okay, so even if the decimal meter is showing us it's only you know 10 and 10, we may hear it as 20 up on the top of a note up in the upper octave and still hear it as 10 when it's back down. It's a weird trick, it gets into psychoacoustics. And, um, but if you realize that, yeah, an E doesn't have that much room for air to move or sound to move, but an O or an A ah does because it's more of a flat tongue, well, on one of those vowels, if you're sustaining it, you may have to end up using abdominal contraction. Uh, because you're going to have to try to, you know, uh, keep up with all the air that's being released. So in general, Tiffany, what I do is I teach everyone how to do both. What I do is I teach them to resist the collapse and uh, relax the abdominal wall. And then what I tell them to do is as they start feeling like they're running out of breath, to start contracting the abdominal wall. So they learn that coordination of up and out, relax, contract as needed. And then based off of any song that they sing, they know how to do both. So it might be they're trying to sing, If I Loved You, and in head voice, they need extra airflow, so they do begin to contract immediately. Well, they know how to do that because they've been on contracting halfway through. It's no different. They already have that skill. And sometimes I'll work on that skill with them vocalizing, especially if we are singing in more of a classical tone. And then if they come into a rock and roll song that's up on a mic and they don't need to sing loud, then they're going to want to keep that rib cage out and uh, really you know, try to hold the breath back and just let the lungs do the work. So uh, hopefully, I uh, hope that helps you out a little bit. And uh, if you have any follow-ups, just let us know. Awesome. So Tiffany, first off, I just want to say thank you. Sounds like you got our course. So, and awesome. You really enjoyed it. So awesome. Thanks for tuning in and being one of our fans. Um, let's see. It looks like that breakdown. Yes. Yeah, so if you have any follow-ups, let us know. We're going to move on to the next question. But Matt, thanks for that breakdown. Yeah. Tiffany, thanks for tuning in with us. So, all right, jumping into our next question here. This one comes in from Linda. Please, I have had a feeling of dryness in my throat since I started singing. What is the cause and how do I manage that? Right. So she said in here, she just started, uh, and we weren't able to fit in the whole question. And the full question said uh, Linda has just started singing recently. And okay. so that's another thing to add in there. So the first thing, Linda, is I want to see if you're doing your basic vocal health, uh, you know, taking care of your basic vocal health needs. Yeah, let's check the that out. One, yeah, the biggest one is hydration. And so the vocal folds have a liquidy mucosa that helps uh, them vibrate and create sound uh, when we're singing or even when we're talking. And if you're not drinking enough water during the day, that will feel dry in there and that can be a problem. So if you are, you know, let's say I'm, a, I'm 200 pounds. So at 200 pounds, I need to drink half of the, that body weight in ounces. So I need to drink 100 ounces of water each day. And uh, the goal is, is that when you urinate, it should be clear. That means that you are well hydrated throughout your body. So that should be the goal. Now, there is a, this kind of a paradox that can happen where you are drinking plenty of water and still feel dry. Why? Well... Your throat is actually coated also with a thin liquidy mucosa. 
And when you drink water, especially if you're drinking it frequently throughout the day, you're actually washing that mucosa away. And your pharynx, which is, you know, the throat uh, until it hits your lungs and your stomach, or the esophagus that goes down to your stomach, well, that whole pharyngeal space can start feeling really dry. So if you're thinking, hey, maybe that is the issue, what you want to do is maybe take a break from drinking water for about 15 minutes. You're going to feel real parched at first, but if you can hold off, your body should start to replenish um, the, uh, the uh, good lubricant that it needs in the pharyngeal wall to keep it from feeling so dried out. So you want to do that. You want to um, see if maybe your speaking habits during the day are getting in the way of you singing later uh, during the day. Like, so for instance, if you have a job where you speak a lot all day, that is going to fatigue your vocal fold. So then when you come to sing, you probably are going to feel pretty dry. Now, there's not a whole lot that you can do except try to minimize some of your voice use or at least bring down the volume level or pitch it up so it feels easier. If I'm at home and just relax, my voice tends to drop down like this. But when I'm talking for a long time to a group of people, I pitch my voice up a little bit because it's less fatiguing. So that's a strategy you could try if uh, perhaps your speech is getting in the way. And then I also want you to just check your diet and see if you're drinking or eating anything that could be drying you out. Uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, people like to have a nice glass of wine or two or three or four every evening to relax. And uh, one usually isn't too bad. And when you start hitting two and three and four, you definitely are going to feel a dehydrating effect from whatever it is that you drank the next day. So you're going to want to look into that. And then you also want to watch what else you're inhaling along the way. Uh, you know, if you're smoking or vaping anything, all of that uh, has irritants in it. And while vaping is better, we believe, than raw smoke, it still has irritants inside of it that can agitate the mucosa that covers the vocal folds and also give you a dry feeling. And the last thing is, is if you jump over to ncbs.org, that's the website for the National Center of Voice and Speech, they have a medication listing under their publications section of their website. And you can look up your medications that you take and see if they might have a drying side effect. So you want to look at that. Uh, asthma inhalers are a big one. Uh, lots of antidepressants also, unfortunately, have drying effects. But if you talk to your prescriber and tell them that the side effects are kind of getting in your way, they can look at some other options for you as well. So I would start there. And if you're running into trouble, then it's probably more of a voice technique thing. And then what I would suggest is you start learning a little bit more about how the voice works. So that way you have the knowledge to figure out exactly where you're getting stuck. And then either do some of that work yourself with a self-guided course like How the Voice Works or by uh, hooking up with a, a vocal coach or a voice teacher. Voice teachers tend to be the ones who are more into the technique side of things, work with that voice teacher and see if you can't overcome some of the barriers that are getting in your way. Great. Now, Matt, I was going to ask in this, um, what if Linda's in like, you know, there's a heat wave going on right now. So it's, you know, it's dry. She didn't say where she lived, but let's assume maybe she's in, you know, a desert or an arid, you know, not humid area, right? Um, what do you recommend in terms of like just humidifier or, you know, other types of things that you can might maybe, you know, use to lubricate her voice? Yeah, great point, Mike. Um, definitely humidifier in your room. And, you know, with it being as hot as it is, you're probably going to want to do the cool mist one. Just make sure you clean it well. I mean, with all humidifiers, clean them well. You don't want mold growing in there. But that uh, cool mist humidifier, Put it in your room and then also get a humidifier meter, a uh, humidity meter. They usually sell them near the humidifiers. And that will tell you what the humidity is in your room because you want to make sure that you don't get it too wet in your room. Otherwise, you'll be growing mold on your walls. And, of course, you don't want it too dry either. And then the other thing, you mentioned like the desert. Well, right now in the Northwest, we have a lot of fires going right now. And it sounds like, unfortunately, we're going to have a lot more through other parts of the country. And so if you are in an area with a lot of air pollution or, you know, uh, pollution coming from the fires, get yourself a nice HEPA filter for your bedroom to make sure that you're clearing those irritants out of your uh, air that you're breathing in the nighttime. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. And please, everyone, practice fire safety, you know. So, yeah. um, all right, Linda, hopefully that helps. And, and write us back if you have any follow up questions on that. I'm going to jump into our next question. This one comes in from Igor. Igor writes in, can I master my voice power and agility through practice? Because I often sing really silently. Yeah. And so, so like, you know, 
well, I don't know. There's a couple different directions you could go on this. So, um, well, it sounds like so. Again, I couldn't get Igor's full question on here because of the uh, the just the limits of the app uh, that we broadcast with. But he was saying it sounded more like he's new to singing. He's just really starting to explore his voice. He, you know, is singing so really silently or really, which I'm thinking is really softly, even in the lower part of his range. So it sounds like. It's, you know, a combination of the place that he's practicing. And he's just saying he wants to get a stronger voice and more agility because that's where he is right now. And the question, the answer to that, Igor, is yes. You can get more voice power and agility through practice. All right. The learning how to sing is like learning any other skill at all. All right. You have to train the physical body to reach an athletic level of performance. Okay, and that requires you to not only, we believe, strengthen the muscles of your abdominal wall, your rib cage, and we have some, uh, you know, idea that maybe there is actually muscle fiber changes happening within the uh, laryngeal muscles as well. But we, we do definitely know, which we're thinking is probably more of the uh, situation, is that the brain is strengthening its neurological connections to those muscles by growing and generating myelin, which is an insulation that covers nerves to help make the signal from our brain travel more efficiently to the muscle that we're trying to activate. And what we know is that through continued practice, you strengthen that brain connection to the muscles and it will be easier for you to sing with a stronger voice because the muscles that have to close your vocal folds together to help give you that power and the muscles that help to help uh, power your respiratory system to give you that power will start knowing how to work together if you keep trying to bring them uh, you know, in the symbiosis so that they're always connected and doing what they need to do. So are you saying that as you practice, the more you practice, your body is just like growing and connecting your thought to what act your voice is actually going to do? Yeah, absolutely. And it's that way with everything you've ever done in your entire life. I mean, from the time you were a baby and you learned how to eat, your brain was building new connections. Every skill you've ever learned in your life has taken this exact same process. And see, this is one of the big misconceptions about singing is, well, we came out of the womb singing and we sang as children. And then all of a sudden we get to be adults after not singing through like, you know, middle school and high school because everybody starts getting afraid of being made fun of. And then you decide later in life you want to sing again. And you're like, well, why can't I just do this? Well, because you quit developing the system. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, when people made you feel bad about singing, I was, I was at the playground with my uh, uh, child today, and I started talking. My wife and I were talking to another mom uh, as our kids had some similar things what they were doing when they were playing. And uh, we started talking about what we did. And she was like, oh, I can't sing. I mean, I love to in my car, but I can't. And I was like, yes, you can. She said, no, I know I can't. And I said, well, the, the issue isn't that you can't. It's that you just, you know, have a train to do it. And I just, I hate when I hear people say that because it makes me think that they've had enough feedback to make them believe that they can't sing. When the truth is they could if they worked on it and they just developed their ability, right? And what we see is in indigenous cultures where singing is a part of society and it's never stopped or other cultures like cultures that go to church on a regular basis where the kids are expected to sing. They can't half sing. They need to sing. In those cultures, we find kids that sing great. By the time they're 16, 17, 18, they sound amazing. Well, it's because nobody ever told them they couldn't. People told them they had to because this is part of our culture. If this is part of what we do. You're going to sing. And so the kids just kept using their instrument. And by the time they're young adults, they're in great shape, right? So, you know, what I would say, uh, Igor, is just to, you know, keep working on doing, uh, you know, all the different sounds you can. And for now, if you're learning, explore every vocal quality that's available to you. Um, you know, not every emotion requires a good vocal quality. Not every emotion that we sing about or every situation we sing about requires a strong vocal quality, right? Some of them need breathy, some need nasally, some need really raspy, some need growls. Uh, some need just a balanced speaking voice. And so you want to make sure that you're making all the sounds so that they're all available to you when you start telling the story so you can let your storyteller lead the way. And, uh, you know, we've already mentioned the course that I have, how the voice works, if you want to learn more about your instrument and uh, learn how to train it like an athlete. But if you are also interested in starting to understand all the sounds you could be making to bring a story to life, 
I have a course on that as well. It's called Singing with Style. And in Singing with Style, I go through and really get you to start thinking about history, thinking about culture, and thinking about how that influenced the way that people use their voices, how rhythm is a part of music, and how all these vocal qualities that we can make can be used to push others away or pull them into us or to set a mood or to paint a picture. So uh, just worth tossing out there. You know, a lot of people are saying it's really, you know, completely changing the way they think about music, which was my goal. And uh, I feel confident it can help you as well. Awesome. I would just add to that, Igor, if you're if you're only singing silently, then you might not get the full voice power and agility you want. Because yeah. I would, the analogy I would use is, you know, you can walk a, a, ra- a lap around a track, right? But you're probably not going to win the race there. You're going to have to start to sprint. You're going to have to start to run. So, you know, with your voice, we have to vary the intensity. And if you're singing silently, you're you're going to be a little, a little too quiet. You're not going to have the full engagement of the arytenoids and the cricothyroids and the balance that you need to sing louder. So like Matt said, you're going to try all the different qualities you can make, the soft ones, the medium ones, the, the you know, the loud, louder ones, and to vary the intensity. Got to do that or you just won't get your whole voice involved. So you'll get closer, but maybe not to master. So if you want to master it, you definitely need to dig in and try all of the, the sounds you can make with your voice. Okay. Anything else, Matt? No, I think that covers it. Good, good, good. Okay. So let's jump into, let's see, a couple more and check the chat. Um, okay. <laughs> there was a funny one that came in. But um, let's go to Kendra next. How do I stop being nasal? Good. So, Kendra, okay. this is a question that comes up so many times. Yeah. That has come up in a couple weeks, though, so I thought it was worth answering just for Kendra. Kind of give you some uh, info because it has actually been a couple months. Um, But so uh, this is the soft palate back here. This is what separates your mouth from your nose, okay? And you can see it with the uvula, that dangly little thing swinging in the back of your throat. That's your uvula. That's part of your soft palate. Now, the soft palate connects up here to the hard palate. If you run your tongue across the roof of your mouth, you feel it's hard in the front, soft in the back. So the part that's hard, we call that the hard palate. The part that's soft, we call that the soft palate. If your soft palate is down, as when you sing NG, like as in sing, all of the air is going to escape through your nose. And if you pinch your nose, sing, you're going to notice that all the sound stops. Now, if we do a really hooty ooh like an owl and go ooh, ooh, when we get that ooh, when you pinch your nose shut, you're going to notice that sound does not go through your nose. That's because the soft palate is all the way up. Then we have something halfway in the middle that's uh, a French nasal O. Oh, uh, uh, uh. And if you do a haw uh, and pinch your nose, you're going to notice that half the sound stops. That's because half the sound is going through the nose. So the easiest way to start training your soft palate to go up is to use consonants P and B. Because you cannot make those consonants with air escaping from your nose. Try it. I want you to do like you're about to say a P. Pinch your nose. You can't feel any air coming out through it. That's because your palate's up. So what we're going to use is uh, the P into an O or an A ah or whatever vowel you want to try to start with. Trying to keep the pressure from the P alive when you go to open up the vowel to keep that soft palate up. Because there's muscles that are lifting that soft palate. we got to coordinate them. So the P is programming your brain to lift and open the soft palate up so it blocks off that nasal cavity. And then as you go into the vowel, we're going to try to get your brain to keep that same sensation in the back so the palate's up. Now, you might feel like, well, I'm engaging a muscle. I'm going to really feel it. No, you're not. It's going to be very subtle. All right? So I want you to say uh, an uh, NG sound and then go, mm, and then do a, and alternate between those two. Mm. Now, I want you to do that really hypernasalized like sound, that ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You know, that little change in the back, it's teeny for most people. That's soft palate lifting. So it's not a huge muscular activity. It's subtle. So that's why we got to fine tune our brain to feel that by repeating this P in the vowel. Pa, pa, pa. Keeps the palate up. Now, if I'm doing this, pa, pa, and I pinch my nose, you'll see that the soft palate's falling down. Right? But I actually feel like I'm having to work harder to get it to go nasal than just letting the P influence the A. Like I said, try the B as well. Then once you get that down, just start sustaining the vowel. Pa. Then move it. You 
you might notice that as you move it, it tries to come back down. As soon as you feel it falling, stop. We don't want your brain learning how to do the wrong thing. We only want it to learn to do the right thing. So only sustain it as long as you can keep the palate up. And day by day, week by week, that time will get longer and longer. And before you know it, you're not going to have nasality in your voice anymore. If you do run into struggles where even though you're trying this P and B trick and that doesn't do enough for you, then it's probably something that has to do with tongue tension as well. A lot of times if we have severe tongue tension, then our soft palate is going to get dragged down because there's actually a muscle that connects the soft palate to the tongue. So if your tongue goes down and back, you're making more nasal. Mm -hmm. Or it's something happening at the vocal fold level where we're just mm -hmm. not getting enough airflow or pressure to even uh, you know help the palate out. So uh, go ahead and uh, you know try this PB. If it doesn't work for you, let us know. And uh, we'll be happy to help. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Like you mentioned, the vocal fold. So sometimes uh, you, you can get trapped, you know, or become nasal, right? If you don't have the right registration, right? You, that can create all kinds of wrong vowel shapes. And so, you know, I would say try some of the stuff we just recommended. But if that doesn't work, then I'd say you might want to just work, start working on the basics of can you sing an octave scale? Yep. And just get your octave scale nice and clean and pure and then add an octave in a third and an octave in a fifth. And probably by the time you get to an octave in a fifth, it should clear up. So I'd be shocked if you were nasal and still could sing a nice clean octave in a fifth. So just back to the basics. Uh, let's see. Next last question looks like we have and then I'll check the chat. Looks like we got some chats in there. So, OK, this one comes in from Ronnie. Ronnie writes in. My jaw feels really tight when I sing, what can I do? Great, so Ronnie, I'm gonna give you a, a simple test that you can try. Uh, a lot of jaw tension happens because we have muscles that are trying to open the mouth and muscles that are trying to close the mouth. And when they both think they're supposed to be in control, our jaw gets stuck in the middle, all right? And what happens is the higher we go, a lot of times we start to try to open up our mouth and uh, our mouth gets opened wide enough that our brain thinks, oh, it's time to bite down, imagining we're about to take a bite out of food. And so it tries to really engage what's called the master muscle. It's the muscle that starts up here and then inserts down into here. Actually, I got a skull over here. I'll show it to you. So uh, this is the upper cheekbone. This is the master muscle coming down into the mandible. And that muscle, when it clenches, helps us clamp down and to chew. So what I want you to do is to start your fingers up at where it starts and glide your fingers down until you feel a little pocket and then push in on that. And then I want you to drop your jaw, feel that your tongue is just relaxed and flat, and then vocalize. Ah, you're gonna vocalize up and down in that position, making uh, you know an effort to not uh, you know contract this muscle. If you feel it contract, stop, relax. You may find that you start in a breathier quality first and then it lets go. Ah, because a lot of times when we're breathy, the entire instrument starts to relax. Then try to go from breathy to full over a, a continued set of repetitions. Without letting that jaw muscle engage. So you're gonna to wanna to do that work. And then the only other thing I wanted to tell you to do is to check your posture. If your neck is leaned forward, that's gonna be pulling on the muscles that open your jaw and your masseter muscle will definitely try to fight back. We don't want that to happen, so check your posture. Make sure that your head is balanced on the vertebrae inside of your neck. They actually, the balancing point is in between your ears. If you could put a rod right in between your ears, it'd be that center point. That's that top cervical vertebrae. You wanna make sure the head is balanced there. Uh, if it's not, get it to that point and see if that maybe takes some of the tension off of your jaw as well. And you can also uh, massage up here around the temples. This is called the temporalis muscle, and it also is engaged in uh, uh, jaw uh, closing and can creep in as part of jaw tension. So check those muscles, see if that helps. And if not, write us back, let us know, and we'll see what else we can do to help you out. Awesome. I will just say again, sometimes jaw tension can be caused if the registration's not yep. perfectly balanced. So yeah, I kind of look at the tongue and the jaw as if you don't have the freedom inside the larynx, these, these become extra symptoms to tell us, oh, there's some tension creeping in because your body's trying to adjust for probably what's happening below it. Yeah, that's so, a good point. Yeah, you're right. And I mean, I think that we've talked so much about registration for the past couple of weeks. I, mean, I know, I just can't talk about it enough. Yeah, 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 I know. But that's why I just thought I'd kind of address it from the other thing. But Mike's 100% right. And if you go back probably four weeks ago, you're going to find several episodes where we talked in depth about registration. 
And so watch those and you'll be able to pick up some tips that you should try to, especially, you know, learning how to swell from breathy to, you know, a more firm, solid sound and back to a breathy sound. That kind of a skill is what's going to really help you unlock some of the, uh, these tension issues. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so I checked the chat and it was, I don't know who these people drop in and try to spam us. What a troll, Mike. <laughs> Trolls. Trolls are out there. Um, but if any of you real singers, teachers are out there and have a question and want to ask it, drop it in now because it'll give about 30 seconds. Um, but I think we've gone through all of our questions that we had planned for today. And, uh, you know, Tiffany, it was great to have you. Thanks for dropping by and asking your questions. Um, but wow, it's summertime. So, you know, we get to thankfully some parts of America are starting to return to normal. So you get to go to the beach, have a fun time, enjoy your summer vacation. So everyone stay safe out there. Remember to wear your mask, follow your local mandates and laws, um, and stay safe. Don't start any forest fires. We're trying to get rid of the fires and, uh, you know, we love you all. Thanks for tuning in and have a great week. Great. Night. Right. We'll see you guys. Bye bye.